Bien, ahora sí vamos a empezar. Sean todos muy bienvenidos y bienvenidas a este webinar. Muchas gracias por conectarse, muchas gracias por la puntualidad. Eh, yo soy Sandra Reyes, formo parte del staff de LACNI. Welcome to this webinar. Thank you for coming. I'm Sandra Reyes. Let me tell you briefly what uh, the dynamics will be. We're going to talk about, this is an introduction to the uh, Linux console. It's a, a previous, it's a, it's a tutorial prior to the ones that are going to take place in LACNIC 41. Jorge Caro, who is a software architect, a LACNIC senior, will be in charge of this presentation. I'll introduce him later. I wanted to remind you, to, as you saw in uh, earlier today, that the webinar is going to be in Spanish, but please consider that we're going to have simultaneous translation into English and Portuguese, so you can choose your language um, in the, on the toolbar. You can uh, click on the globe and uh, choose your preferred language. Uh, during Jorge's presentation, you have a chance to ask any questions you may have. Please write them down in the Q&A uh, panel, and Jorge will, will answer them as they come. I'm going to support him, and I'm going to tell him that there are questions. Finally, let me tell you that this webinar is being recorded, and in uh, very soon we'll share it uh, with you, uh, but you can also um, see it um, if you visit our website. So, Jorge, go ahead. Thank you, Sandra. Good morning, uh, everybody. We are going to start by sharing my uh, screen so that you can see it. Can you see it? Excellent. So, this is a course um, uh, this is the Linux console that it's a tool that can help you a lot uh, increasing your uh, um, productivities. You are very used uh, to use Windows and Mac uh, and even to use Linux, but with some of the desktops installed, it is very good for you to learn how to use um, the console. So I hope that uh, this will give you an idea of the things you can do with a console. I hope you like them, you like it, and I hope you decide to investigate a bit further if you need it for some specific purposes. So, what are the reasons why uh, you should use it? Well, because it consumes uh, fewer resources than the graphic interface. Uh, um, if you are uh, somewhere around in the world, uh, in the cloud, you use uh, much less uh, resources in terms of memory and um, in the cloud. Uh, and then uh, if you have to click uh, and uh, move the mouse in the uh, web and working with uh, multiple files is much easier. It's possible to create scripts to automate repetitive uh, task. Many of us have more than one server that does the same thing because we have a web server, so we have two. That gives us redundance and um, uh, load balance. So it's much easier to have a script installing everything necessary in the server and then run it again in the, in the other server so that you have both things installed. You can do it manually or you could step by step installing it in both places, but it's very easy if you install it in the second or if you do a movement in the first and then there's a difference with the second. Audit and debug errors uh, is uh, easier uh, uh, because you have an access to all the files in the system, so you have more information to find the sources of error for, uh, for any bugs. And it is uh, absolutely necessary to to think of working in the cloud. Today, that sense of fashion. These are remote servers, not necessarily, uh, not even in the same city or in the same uh, country. It may be just uh, the other corner of the wor world. So installing servers with the console is much easier than with a graphic interface buffet. There is, we are going to see several commands. We're going to see how 
they are used, but my idea is uh, it should be a sort of buffet that uh, you have a bit of everything, but not uh, um, uh, working so much with each. I want you to leave with an idea of what the things that are possible with the console, but then on your own, you can go more in depth, uh, trying each command and discover additional commands depending on what you need to do. But here, I want you to get a taste of the commands so that you may become familiar with the infrastructure and every and you may see everything the console offers. Uh, the console offers uh, a documentation uh, a command, uh, the man command. I give, for instance, the ls command, and it gives me very complete information of what the command is for, how you use it, its description, all the arguments, the the uh, options that you may have to use that command. Google gives a very good tool uh, to find information, but if you want more local information and faster, you can run the man command and you'll find a lot of information on any type of command you may want to use. The platform for this course, I'm using Debian 11. Basically, it's a Linux uh, distribution. It's one of the most popular. I think that now, by now uh, there's a 12th version, uh, but uh, it's uh, 11 is still used. All the commands uh, operate almost, run almost the same in all um, the uh, Linux uh, distros. Uh, you can use uh, Cache, uh, Bentos, Alpine. The commands work almost the same. There may be some uh, variations depending on the version, but everything that we see apply will applies the same in all linux uh, um, distributions and if you uh, have a, a bsd for instance uh, for instance you may you use a free bsd open bsd and mac awesome and uh, um, but not not necessarily with linux maybe some other uh, unix versions so let's see the types of users linux support um, supports more than one user. The three types. Uh, the first is root. That is the main user. The, the uh, root can do everything. If you want to uh, delete the entire OS, uh, you can do it or install uh, packets or create um, uh, files. Root can uh, enables you to do everything, and you have to be very careful when you use the root user because you may uh, wreak havoc if you don't know what you're using. So the recommendation then is that because of that, not to use root daily. It's better to uh, uh, create real users, Jorge Cano or Jorge, or in my case, I, I, I put J Cano for my everyday activities. And uh, because uh, the real user cannot break the system. And only when you want to Google or something, you use root or uh, um, another, as we are going to see later on. Usually, real users have a, a, a home. Uh, that's the root uh, folder where you can create uh, files or you can create um, uh, well, files, and uh, you have all those folders for whatever you may want to do. And there are also uh, service users. They, When you run a service, for instance, a, a web server as Apache, it, it is not recommendable to use it as root user or real user, but your own user. Create an Apache user or a web user because the well, the name doesn't matter, but that user only will be given the permits to execute the Apache services and the files that uh, and the files that the web server has access to, and that's all. That is because if for any reason in the software there's a vulnerability, and um, and uh, so in that case you only have access and you don't have access to root or to the, the files of real users so you limit uh, the trouble 
So that is why it is recommended to use uh, uh, specific uh, users, groups. Uh, users can belong to one or more groups. In this case, uh, groups command shows you all the groups uh, of uh, the people that are logged. In this case, the user Jorge belongs to the user Jorge, CD-ROM, the group uh, sudo, uh, audio, video, plug dev, netvet, Docker. So all the users may belong to one or more groups. What are the groups for? To assign permits. It's much easier to assign permits to a group and then to assign um, uh, users to that group, and they're going to share all the permits, then uh, provide, then uh, uh, assigning um, uh, permits to each. Uh, um, if you have somebody new, then it's much easier to assign that uh, user to the administrators, and they, and in that category, he will have all uh, the permits necessary. Then having to assign each uh, possibility to that uh, sign. And uh, you, when, when you don't need it anymore, you delete it from that group and you don't have to be removing those permits to that user. The files have permits in Linux in general. Everything is a file or a socket. Uh, the, you have a, a web connection, that's a file. Um, Oh, everything is seen as uh, files, and the files have permits. In this case, for instance, we have a list of several files, and each, uh, for instance, cat, resolve.conf, RPC, etc., shadow. So the first column that we see that says root shows the owner of the file. Who's the owner of the file we are seeing? In this case, they all belong to root. Then we have the group. What group does this file belong to? So um, here we have shadow and then uh, the size of uh, the file, uh, the, the date it was uh, modified. And then these flags at, at the left uh, shows us the permissions of the file. For instance, the first letter D shows us if it's a directory. That is, it's not a file. It's a directory that contains uh, for, uh, more uh, directories and files, and the second is uh, the, the permissions of uh, the user, the owner. RWX shows reading, writing, and execution uh, permissions. And then the next group uh, is the uh, group permissions. Mm, I might not be the owner of the file, but if I belong to the same group uh, that has a file, I have a permissions uh, for, to use it. Uh, so. Um, here you see that you, I don't have the W, so I cannot write on it, but I can read it. And finally, you have the permissions of other users. That is, I'm not the owner, I don't belong to the group. What are the permissions I have on this user? And see if uh, you can read them, such as in the cat that this is binary, you can read it and run it. But for instance, in the case of Shadow, that's the last file, you can't even read it. You can't read and edit or write on it or execute it. And this is important because Shadow contains all the passwords of the system users. So this specific file, Shadow, uh, root can uh, uh, read it about any person or application that is in the Shadow group can read it, but that's the only thing they can do. And any other System users have no permissions whatsoever. They can't even read it. So the uh, um, in the the uh, app or uh, the binary that authenticates this, uh, the system belongs to the shadow group, so they can read the file, so that you can log in, but you can't alter it. Only root can update the file. In this case, shadow. File systems. If you are familiar with Windows, with Mac, Linux is similar. It's a tree, a directory tree. They have more directories or files in a tree format, and each Rio user has a home directory. It's what I said at the beginning. So 
uh, with this directory, I, I can use it to create files, MP3, whatever I need, I can do with this uh, directory. Normally, it's in the route slash home. And I say regularly because uh, it's a, uh, you can configure it in a different way. A system user um, may change the route so that it will be in a completely different place, but usually it's in the slash home. So the character slash is used to delimit the directories, and this shows where this uh, division takes place. Then you have the routes, the absolute and the relative types of routes. The absolute route is when at the root we say the entire route is one file. For example, in this case, home slash Jorge slash documentos slash etc. So this shows the entire route through to the file. And the relative route is something that depends on the location in the directory. What part of the tree, if I'm at home, the home is slash Jorge, then if I don't start with slash, I just start with the directory name, so it's documents slash libros. So I reach the same destination with this relative route, but depending on where I am in this directory. Linux commands. These commands normally follow this command. It's not an obligation to follow this type of format, but all the commands we'll be seeing today follow this format, which is a command name, then a hyphen for the options or attributes or arguments that you wish to change, and then the arguments as such, which is those that are mandatory, the ones that show us what they are, depending on the position in which they have been written. Let me give you a brief example. So this is a map. I'm in con connecting with the SSH command with the Debian Linux machine. It asked me for the password to access. And with the command, who am I? We're going to see what, with what user I'm connected. This is Jorge. And if I enter groups, as I was saying, we can see which group this belongs to. It only belongs to two groups, to Jorge and to Sudo. With PWD, we can see in what directory I am located. In this case, this is the home. And command LS allows me to see the contents of the directory. Here we have three further directories. With a CD command, we can change directory here. Documents has two text files, and with the cat command, I can see the contents of that file. In this case, this is a list of books. And head is similar to cat, but I see all the lines, which is a very big file. I can use head just to see the first three lines. The minus n shows me how many lines I wish to have. Here, I don't really want the first three, which are these here. And then with cd dot dot, I can go back to the parent directory. LS can also show you the directories. You can change ls config to see the content. Bind shows you the content of those directories, but we haven't moved from that directory. We are still at the home, in our home. And history allows me to see the history of all the commands that I have tipped into the console. I don't know what command I typed in to do this or the other, and I want to check that again. So you can put history, and you can check the last commands that you typed in. Processes. Each program that is being executed is a process. Each process has a unique identifier. This identifier is produced by the OS. If you run a command, it gives you a unique identifier, which is then tracked by the system. And the operation 
assigns the resources to the processes, so how much RAM memory you're going to use, how much processor, and that is what the operation system does. A process can launch child processes, so you have a server that is listening in a port with queries from clients. When you receive a query, then normally the server launches a child process and to release this in order to receive another connection and then assign this to a new process. Let's have an, see an example. I have a script which is called Ola. It's very basic. It just writes Ola and the sequence number with which it is running. It is run here with control setup. We can stop this. We did stop this to release the console to do some other process. You run other commands. And with FG, we can access the background. This process does not continue in the background, just stopped. So with control C, we can stop the process. Jorge, we have a question in the panel from Rachel Gabby. She asks, what does PWD mean? That's a great question. If I'm not mistaken, it means print working directory. So it prints the directory in which I'm working. Many of these commands normally mean something like ls, which is list. And pwd, if I'm not mistaken, means print working directory. Thank you, Jorge. Then we have bind. It is likely that many of you are familiar with this. This is a DMS open source server. It can work as an authoritative or recursive server. For many, it's the benchmark for the DNS standards. It's very much used. And let's have a look how to run this command. I have a configuration, which is configs bind. With the list, we can see the files that I have in this folder. I can use ls minus l, so I can show the list containing more information on this file with h. Instead of seeing 496 bytes, I can see these other options. And with nd, I can run the server. It's already running here. And if you look at this, I block the console. I cannot do anything else. So this is not how a server normally runs. Normally, they run in the background. So in this case, we can allow it to run in the background. And it's running without blocking the console. With the ps command, we can see what the processes are running in the server. In this case, 927 is the process that is being run. And with netstat, I can see which are the processes that are listening and what interfaces are. Mind is running in several interfaces that are configured in the local machine in the 8053 port. Then with dig, I can check to see whether this is running correctly. And it answered with an IP address, for example, .com. And if we want to kill a process, we use kill minus nine. Minus nine is to kill the parent process and any child process that is running. In this case, it's 927. And we can see in PS. And if we're going to run this, we can see it's no longer running. So we killed it with this command, with the kill command. If we run netstat, we see, we check to see that it's not running in any of the other interfaces. Netstat, L-T-U-N, is to list those that are listening to the ports in PCP and UDP. And then CD is to show the ports, the number of ports, instead of the protocol. 
And if you run this with the N, it shows TCP 0, 0, 0, 0002222, 22, and then you have the SSH port, uh, the TCP 6, and then UDP, you have this other answer. So this shows the protocol, or uh, maybe it's better to put N. Why is this so? Because it runs a bit faster. You don't need to start researching what this port, what protocol this port corresponds to. We have another question, Jorge. I think this refers to the previous slide. When you create a Linux user by default, you create, do you create a group with the same name? For example, for your user Jorge, I see this belongs to the groups Jorge and Sudo. That's my question. Yes, when you create a Linux user, you create a new group with the same name. And by default, this belongs to that group only. Now, this depends on the distribution, but normally it belongs to that group. And you can then add this to other groups depending on the permissions you need to give to that user. But yes, it's like you asked, when you create a user, you create a group with the same name. <clears throat> we have no more questions. Thank you. No packet uh, managers. All the Linux distributions normally come with a packet manager. There are no, several ones. APT is only used by the Debian family. For example, Debian, Mandrake, Ubuntu, all come with APT. Now, if you use Fedora or CentOS and some other type of distribution or variants of CentOS or Fedora, you use YUM. You can also have Pac-Man. If you use Alpine, it comes with APK. All work in a similar way. The commands and names might vary depending on which one is running. So you have to check the manual to see which other ones they use. APT is the one used by Debian. But to use dual or YAM or Pacman or APK, it's quite APK is quite similar. For a, example, APK install, I think it used APK add instead of install. But these are small variations of the same things, and they serve to install or to update or also to eliminate packets. Let me give you an example using APT. APT update and it gives us an error. This is because I don't have permissions to run this command. My user doesn't normally have, but if I use a sudo command, I could give temporary permissions so it can then execute this command. So I put apt update, upgrade, and these are the packets. And we have three, and with the, the upgrade command, I can then update. So you see, this is quite a simple way to update to upgrade the system. Now let us install a bind server, how it really should be installed. This is the apt installed. This installs a bind 9, which is a packet in Debian. And it's going to install bind 9 and all these dependencies. It's installing the entire set of necessary packets. And the bind gives you the necessary permissions we're also going to install Apache 2, which is, is a web server that we're going to be using. So this is the installation of all the dependencies, all the attributions, and now we have the two set up using APT. Now let us configure the bind. Normally, it's done in the file etc bind. Here, we install all the configuration files. The clear command is used to clear the screen. Let's look at the contents of named.conf. Here, it shows that the configuration should be done in named.conf.options 
dot local. Here we can see the content of option, and now let's have a look at the contents of local. And before that, I want to have a copy to have the original one. So use this command cp to command, the cp command to copy. I'm going to copy options, and it's uh, extension bkp, and I'm going to make a backup copy of the local about to have a copy. So I have a copy of in the event of any situation. So this is for security backup regions. So bi is a text option. Now, prior to editing, it sends me a warning. It's This is a message as a user. So we once again use sudo with vi named .conf. Now I have options to write that file. So I go to the session to state that this is, I'm going to stop the recursion. And I'm going to state that I am not going to allow transfers to anyone. This is for security reasons. Now, the important thing here is how to configure these services. Normally, the services are configured through configuration files. So this shows this zone that is going to change. This is the zone called example.com. We um, uh, say that it's a master zone. We say that where it is, and here it's in etz bind example.com zone. And we um, save uh, the record with W and Q that is to quit. So now we are going to copy the uh, setup uh, of files that I have saved in my folder. In this case, uh, I'm going to use uh, this uh, router and, and here put uh, copy with uh, the file. And this is why I put this dot at the end because it shows uh, this directory with uh, um, the uh, name um, named uh, check. Um, I can check uh, the configuration, and as it uh, doesn't give me any errors, that means that uh, the configuration is right. And with system, I can control the uh, services here with status bind nine. I can see the status of the bind service. In this case, it's not running because it's not properly configured. So what we're going to do is to reboot it to do, uh, restart it and with this we restart the service and now if we uh, give status we should see that it is running properly the service is active and running so now here we can use uh, the uh, uh, dig command to uh, do um, a DNS uh, query in the server and to see that it is responding properly. With CD and uh, this sign, you see that uh, here, With this tilde, with this, I can create a file that has all the configuration of the bind. In this case, I want to save a file as a backup with all the configuration. This is, uh, it uh, groups all the, the files in a single one so that you can use them easier. And if you want to compress it, you can use a tool that uh, allows you you see here you see that the tar file occupies 20 k's but if we uh, zip it uh, with a g zip there you see the this is the maximum degree of compression it's nine and if we query again you see that now 
it only measures 2.9 case. We create a directory that's called uh, backup um, with the command mk mk dir, and uh, here I'm moving the file from the my current directory to the backups uh, directory. And if we see, so if we see the content of backups um, here. I'm Java, the compressed uh, uh, tar with a combination of the bind as a backup. Do you have any questions so far? Yes, we have a question. Simon Perez of Cordoba, he says, I'm more of the world of uh, routing switches, firewalls, and security. Uh, I, the, the basic things of links, but I'd like to know whether for security there are any scripts or routine in Linux. All right, we won't see that today because that's a bit more advanced, but in the earnings there, there are books on how to ensure a server um, or to provide security to a server. You can. Uh, find scripts written by third uh, uh, persons to stop uh, unnecessary services, to check passwords, that sort of things. We won't see it. You can look it up in the internet. There's a lot of information about it. But if you want a basic guideline of how to provide security to servers, don't install anything you don't need. Install the baseline, the indispensable things that you need. And if there are services that are running and you don't need them, for instance, I don't know, but printing services, uh, graphic interfaces, uh, those things, don't uh, install them uh, uh, as you start. Each service needs to have a user, and uh, the user needs to have the permissions necessary only to run uh, that. Uh, and, and if you have administration uh, users, they need to have the permissions, only the ones that they need to use. You may have a system administrator that needs to have access to everything, but maybe you have an operator. There's no need for the operator to have a permission for everything, but just to read uh, the logs and only that, or maybe to restart uh, the app or something like that. So the more restrictive you are, the safer, the more, secu the more secure that you make it, but it's also more difficult to manage it. So it depends on the level of security that you need and to what extent you are ready to run the risk and uh, for the sake of flexibility of a system. Maybe you say, well, this is a very important service. I may have the HTTP service running, well, that's not a good practice, but it's the easiest thing to do now. So it's it may not be recommendable, but you can do it. And so I'm worried about security. If you, you can say, well, I'm worried about security. I want it to be secure. Well, the tips that I'm giving you are good ways to start. And there are books. Um, whole books uh, uh, telling you how to provide security to a server. I recommend you to read a lot about this. Adapt, uh, adapt it to whatever you need, because you will see that there's a range of security levels, and it might be very complicated. And you may not need so much. You may uh, just want a shorter thing and there to generate scripts. You run it in all the servers so you can have a more standard way of what's running in that server. And you have everything uh, homogeneous. Thank you, Jorge. Simon Perez is thanking. Now we have another comment. Well, actually, it's a request by Rachel Vasquez who says, please tell us about the band, the contents of band. 
the a bind a bind bind is a dns server so if you are familiar with the protocol it's it what changes the domain names to ip addresses if you uh, search uh, google.com the dns server is what changes from doodle google uh, google.com to the ip address of that domain so you can connect usually we don't see it it's not visible it's a protocol that is used to more uh, underneath the services and it's a very important protocol for the structure of the internet but that is not typically seen by the users you don't see how it works in this case bind is a server that implements a dns protocol it is no, this is not a course on bind so i don't want to spend too much time uh, uh, telling you the details i just wanted you to see how you configure a service in linux as a matter of fact the next example is how you configure apache uh, web uh, uh, so, uh, so i want you to see the controls the kill next star the, uh, and then uh, be able to edit so that you can see how that is done now the details as how bind and apache work and how you configure them well those are details that you should see uh, outside uh, this presentation now here the only thing i want to show is how you configure it but just uh, broadly speaking um, to see what uh, it allows you to do with linux but not necessarily seeing each service uh, specifically thank you for your answer jorge we don't have any more questions so as i was telling you now we are going to see the apache server this is a web server with with uh, here i can uh, add a um, request uh, uh, queries with uh, and and here is so you put curl and this gives me the header not all the contents of the page but here i can see that it answered correctly now let's install a browser for the console that's called links of course it cannot uh, deploy images nor can it change the size of the fonts nothing of that sort it's very plain very basic but you can consult any web uh, website from the console by using this uh, browser uh, you see this is the found page of uh, apache so that means that it was correctly installed but links can also you can uh, uh, um, contact any servers for instance here wikipedia so you won't see it so nice because it only has letters and colors and a limited number of colors however we can read uh, the entire wikipedia we can conduct a search as we would do with any web uh, browser here we're searching uh, the, the website of lacnic and wikipedia so it takes it may take a bit uh, but you see the content it doesn't show the logos but just well here it says that well here here you see that there's there should be a logo you can navigate uh, in the links and you can click on any in this case we went to neckbr their website and you can see the information that uh, wikipedia includes about neckbr so i i i thought it would be a funny thing to show you this oh, uh, a console only web uh, browser in this case we use it to test that our apache server is work is running properly any questions so far jorge yes well actually this is a comment that Henry Godoy says that it's, he says, Rachel Lackney Campos uh, has a very comprehensive course 
on DNS. But this, so this was an answer for Rachel, but it it's, uh, has nothing to do with what you said. Well, that's a very good comment. And you, thank you, Henry. And yes, if you're interested, you can learn a bit more there. Uh, so, uh, e e e putting commands together, Unix has the philosophy that each command must do just one thing and do it right. So together with that, you may get uh, the exit uh, or the result of a command and you can use it as an entry for the next uh, command. For instance, command one slash or pi, CM, command two slash two n commands. So the exit of command one serves as an entry to command two, which is uh, the entry for command three and so on. Uh, and uh, you can put uh, as many commands as you want. Let's see an example, mkdir, do you, use, you create a directory that's called uh, temp and then we're going to put uh, this uh, libros.txt in the temp folder and we change to the temp uh, folder and we list the contents to check that the file was copied. We've got, we can see the contents of the file. With tail, it works the same as with cat, but it just shows the last lines in the file. And this is very useful when you are checking logs and you just wish to see the last log commands or lines. And with minus n, we can see how many lines we want to have from this file. I've just put my three, which are the last three lines. Or we can also put plus four, which it shows, I want to see all the lines as from line four. In this case, we take out the banner we had for the first three lines, or we can use the bar for linking this with a sort command in order to organize this in alphabetical order. And now everything has been organized in alphabetical order. With AWK, we can divide the file into columns. The, the divider is a comma and we can print column number two. We're going to print in this case only the author's name. So removing the first column, which are the book names, and we're just going to leave the authors. Here, we link this to the sort to organize the authors in alphabetical order. And if you check here, some have been repeated because we have several books from the same author. So with the command unique, we can eliminate those that have been repeated. If we want to see how many repetitions we have for each of the names, we put minus C in the unique command, and it shows us how often that name appears in the file. We can also put store with R minus R to see which is the author that has the largest number of books. In this case, it's Stephen King. He has three books. So we can also use greater than to send this output to a specific file. In this case, we're going to store it in cuentas.txt. And when we put ls, so we now have two files. And we can then check the content with cat from the content of a file. And this is the output that we save in the commands we ran. Any questions so far? We have no questions for the time being, but we still have a few seconds to encourage those who wish to send us their questions in the Q&A panel. All right, great. So let us continue playing around with the text files and with the commands. We're going to use tail again to remove the first three lines, which is this banner of the favorite books. I'm going to use sed, S-E-D, to eliminate the last point in each line. So we remove the dot the, at the end of each line. A-W-K is to act separate this into columns. And now I'm going to first print column number two 
comma, space, column number one, and then dot. So here we change the order. Column will now, the column will now have the author's name and then the name of the book. So originally we had the name of the book and then the author. So we here changed several other text lines. I could have changed this by hand, but I have a file with thousands of books and authors, and otherwise it would have been quite tedious to do this by hand. So here we can change this in a couple of seconds. Okay. So let us go back to the parent directory with R on dear, it failed to remove with RM minus RF, we can delete this. And with this command here, it deletes the entire content. So we don't have the directory and the content. And with the FM, RM, it's forced to do this. It's going to delete it, and the R is to indicate recursiveness. I'm going to delete the directory and everything that is below this. And please pay attention here, because it's not like with Windows or with Mac, that you take this to a bin where you can recover it. Here, you delete the file, and it's gone. So there's no way to recover the file. It's not that you go to the, to the trash bin, and here it's eliminated completely. So there are some options that allow you to recover this, but these are not so easy to use. They are quite complicated and they don't work perfectly well. So as a general rule, whenever you're going to run the command to delete, the rm command, please be careful with what you're going to remove or delete. Please be cautious, otherwise it will be quite difficult to recover whatever you deleted. Now let's go to the documents directory. Let's once again see the books, the libros contents, libros.txt. With grep, we can look for words within a file. For example, let's look up the word king, and we see the lines where that word comes up. And we can put the, so we can see more lines here. And with minus n, it will show us in which line number that word appears. With find, we're going to look up file names. For example, file in the etc file, we're going to look up all the names called named.conf and asterisk. Here, it found all these files over here, which are called named.conf. Now, if we want to look up within those files, we look for grep, R is recursive, N is a line, and W is a full word. In this case, we're going to put example.com, and it shows us all the files where the word example.com was found. You have the file name, and you have the line number where that word was found. Any questions so far? Yes, we have two questions. The one is more general. It's from Christian Viteri. And the question is, this course, this workshop, for which of the topics of LACNIC 21 will this be useful? For which of the tutorials? I understand that there will be some secure routing tutorials and RPKI validators, which are normally installed in the Linux servers. And then there will be one, a hackathon on DNS. Yes, exactly. So there you can use this. And I think this will be bind for the hackathon, but I'm not totally sure. So this is a good way to learn, those who wish to know how bind works, go to the hackathon. And there you'll have practices with DNS. 
Great, thank you, Jorge. We have another question here from Simon Perez. And he says, for troubleshooting issues, once the Linux service has been operational for a long time, what are the type of commands or routines that you recommend? For example, revision of use of memory, etc. We'll see this later on. That's the next topic that's coming up. Thank you. And the people are asking about the recording of this workshop. And this is something I can answer. Yes, Jorge, this question is being recorded and over the coming days we'll be sharing this recording in the website of the event under preparatory activities. No more questions so far. So administration. This console also allows you to do server administration tasks, for example, to revise the space available in the hard disk, to revise processes that are running and consuming more resources, to verify the parameters and network connectivity, to revise the log files, how these performed, how the services performed, among other things. For example, with the command top, we can see all the processes that are running and how much memory and CPU they are consuming. This is a great command when you see that things are slow to see which is a process that is consuming too much CPU or consuming too much memory. And with clear, the clear command, you can delete the contents of the screen. TF shows us the contents of the hard disk. Here you have the partitions how much is being used, how much space available. With DU, you can see how much space a file is occupying. With IP, it shows the IP configurations of the page that you are using. You can configure these, you can assign these. With, and the pink command, which you are probably familiar with, is the one that has to do with connectivity. He was connecting with the 8888, which is a Google DNS server. And is an easy way to check whether the machine has internet connectivity. OK. This might have been a bit fast, but these are all the commands that are used to check how a server is running. And quite obviously, Normally, you have monitoring in, configured into your machines, and there are other machines that are checking the performance of that server, and it's checking memory, it's judging, checking CPU and the load, it's also checking space in the hard disk. So when it exceeds a given value, you get a warning. And one of them that is most used today is one called Prometheus. This is a way to monitor a service without having to do this by hand. But if we wish to check a specific server to see how this is working, then this can allow you to see the basics of and to see if this is working correctly. Scripting, as I was telling you, scripting can be used to automate repetitive tasks. It allows execution of several commands with one single instruction that assists in standardizing several servers so that they're all running with the same programs, with the same installations. It assists to prevent human errors. So instead of running one command, you can run a list of commands that may lead to mistakes. Here we have a very basic script with a command date, and it prints the time and the date. So let us create a small file called reloj.sh. Touch creates a blank file. So we can see the content of the file list, and the A plus X allows execution. With change mod, it allows us to add X to everyone. And now we have the permissions to run this. Reloj is clock. So we run this file. I'm going to start with bin bash, which is a bash script, while true. And in those cases, 
it will be true. And now I'm going to put the variable now for the date command. I'm going to print this in the console with slash r is to go back to the beginning of the line and then the variable now. Then we one second. I can then store this file and now we can run this script reloj.sh and I'm going to have the date and the time printed on the screen. Reloj is a Spanish word for clock. This is very basic and the idea is to show you how this works, but you can create the installation script. You can install this for services in general. Here I have one that I prepared to install this program used by Prometheus with slash more. And you can see now the file step by step to see it completely. And if you pay attention, this is far more complete that does many more things. To install this with VI, you can edit the file. So VI corrects the syntaxis. You can define constants and functions. You can download dependencies. You can download code. You can install this. You can configure the service. And everything is done automatically, just running one single command, the script command. So I think we are on time now. This is what I had to share with you today. Are there any questions that have been asked? Thank you, Jorge. Yes, we have finished on time. We have no more questions. Would anyone else like to ask any questions? You can do so now. We can add a couple of minutes if you wish. And otherwise, we can close this workshop here. Would you like to address a few words, final words? Thank you for your attention. I was a bit fast at the end because I was running out of time. But if you have any questions, I'm at your disposal. So while we wait to have more questions, let me tell you that the DNS course will have a second edition for those who joined the course site and saw that this was closed. We'll have a second edition of that course in the month of October, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to enter the link with the calendar and more information on the contents. I see that there might be more questions, greetings, and thanks to Jorge, too. So I think we have finished here. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Jorge, for your time. Thank you for this workshop. We are seven days away from the beginning of the event of LACNIC 41 in Panama. So we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge.